Welcome to March. It's Women's History Month, which seemed to me like a great opportunity to talk about how women are shaping and changing the field of fundraising, which is why I'm so excited to share today's episode with you. I had the pleasure of sitting down with special guest Yolanda F. Johnson of YFJ Consulting and Women of Color in Fundraising and Philanthropy, and we had an incredible conversation. Listen in to hear more about her work and to hear her perspective on how we can lift up women in the nonprofit sector. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Welcome to the Nothing But Major Gifts podcast from Veritas Group, featuring Richard Perry and Jeff Schreifels. Twice a month, we bring you the latest and best thinking about major gift fundraising, so you can develop authentic relationships with your major donors. Here are your hosts, Richard and Jeff. Welcome to the podcast today. I'm Jeff Schreifels, and I'm so excited to be here today with a very special guest. Today, I'm speaking with Yolanda F. Johnson, the president and founder of YFJ Consulting and Women of Color in Fundraising and Leadership, which specializes in fundraising, philanthropy, and best practices for equity and inclusion. And since we're celebrating Women's History Month right now, for today's conversation, we'll be taking a look at some of the challenges and also celebrating the successes of women in the nonprofit sector. Thank you so much for being here, Yolanda. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Well, first, I'd love to start off the conversation by asking you a little bit to share about yourself and the work you're doing and what's all happening in your life right now. Ah, so many wonderful things are happening. Uh, we have really kicked off the year with woke and I have personally, I don't ever make new year's resolutions, but okay. uh, what I do is I always, we think of the power of language and the power of words. So yeah. I choose a word um, that helps inform. I, I don't allow myself to be bound by the word, but rather it's a guiding sort of okay. a po point of light. And yeah. for 2024, it's intentionality. Mm. Yeah. And Good. the sub word is intersectionality, because when you're intentional, you can find the intersections. And it's a wonderful thing that happens. That's right. Um, yeah. So this year, uh, some things that we're really looking forward to in my life, of course, the work of YFJ Consulting continues with our brilliant clients, uh, you know, everywhere the work exists at the uh, intersection, intersection. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I feel like we're going to be, what was the show where uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse or whatever the word was said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm dating myself there, I guess. But uh, <laughs> I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, but uh, to really focus on helping people from the fundraising perspective, but also advising. Uh, from the philanthropy and grant making side and then in between there ensuring that the entire sector thinks more inclusively so uh, to that end I'm very very excited about some things that are happening here in women's history month of course it's a very busy time for uh, all of the different hats that i wear uh, i've just joined the women's philanthropy institute national council and woke is going to be partnering with them on a very special event which is the place where all of my worlds converge in the most beautiful of ways. Uh, so it's about women, philanthropy, and the arts. Uh, I'll be giving some opening remarks followed by a beautiful panel that features uh, Jeannie Sager as the moderator. And uh, we've, we've got some wonderful panelists that really span all of the different types of performing and visual arts. And then we're going to head into an abridged version of a special performance of Women Composers, a concert lecture that I developed with wow. two friends of mine, doctors Brooke Bryant and Michael Eisenberg. We're bringing in a harpsichord on one side, have the piano on the other. That's um, awesome. I know you. Brooke. I you know do? Brooke. Yes. Yes. She's awesome. She's been, we've been friends for a really really long time yeah and we share that sort of you know we've crafted a life where she has the doctorate in historic musicology but she's a, an amazing fundraiser yeah and uh and so i have built my career in philanthropy and in fundraising and never stopped singing and so um yeah it's one of our proudest works it's the 10th anniversary of music she wrote so we're excited That's we'll be performing it throughout the month of march at lots of different venues but yeah. we're 
kicking off at the Domina Center for Classical Music uh, to talk about women philanthropy, the role that women have played in supporting the arts, and then the role that women have played in creating music and, and art. And then we'll have some refreshments at the end to celebrate so if you're in the new york city area we invite you uh to join Um, us i totally want to see this um this sounds fantastic you're a busy woman you're like the renaissance woman you're like in you're a little you're in everything i love it i love it there are only two paths though i know it seems like a lot but it's really the whole reason I got started in philanthropy was because of music. When I was a senior in college, getting my performance degree yes. and a lot of orchestras were closing. And my professor said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to learn this other side of what keeps <laughs> the arts alive. But then I was like, oh my gosh, I can use philanthropy as a tool for women, for racial equity, for the arts, for youth development, for people with disabilities. I, I realized yeah. the power of it to make change. That's awesome. I love it. Okay. I got to ask you this question. I know you've been an incredible advocate for women and women of color in fundraising. Let's talk about first, what are some of the successes you're seeing and celebrating right now for women in our sector? Well, we all knew that 2024 was going to be a very interesting year, Um, contentious in its own ways. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Uh, but with the, you know, the election cycle and just so many things happening, yeah. what we didn't know is that it would start out of the gate, you know, with some of the, the challenges that we would see. But I think, you know, the win for women and for women of color is aligned with and akin to the very mission of women of color and fundraising and philanthropy, which is that we get away from the scarcity mindset mm. and that we find those ways to work together, to champion each other. Uh, to continue moving the good work forward. And so I've just seen so many wonderful things on a personal and professional level, seeing women of color and women in general come together, collaborate, look ahead um, at what the year is going to bring and be really strategic and intentional um, about the ways that we can impact our sector and society as a whole. So I've seen many different exciting things come up, but you know, the real key is for us to support each other. I love that. And I love the whole concept of embracing abundance Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of getting away from that scarcity mindset that it, many of us, it's hard to do. Um, So that's amazing. That's, those are great things to celebrate. Um, But what do you see some of the bigger challenges right now facing women in fundraising? Uh, Well, there are some of the more obvious challenges mm-hmm. uh, that we still have a, a wage and pay gap. Uh, we're going to yeah. really be looking at equal pay days this year in partnership with some other organizations that champion equal pay for women. Uh, but the paradigm has shifted and the dynamic has shifted as well because it's a different hiring uh, environment. Um, yeah. Women and women of color are now looking to see if roles really fit them and their lifestyles and their needs. Uh, and so it's been interesting what we've seen, you know, as far as the search sector is concerned um, with a lot of that. But I think that the work continues there. The work continues for the workplace itself, um, mm-hmm. just to create environments that are more inclusive for women, that are more thoughtful as far as that's concerned, and really set people up for success because there's so much talent out there. Um, and I think that during this particular year, where thinking about diversity, thinking about equity and inclusion Mm -hmm. is, you know, how how else can we describe it? Then it's under attack in many different ways. Uh, How do we stand together just to to clarify and redefine? You know, I I had a quote, I do some Monday motivation quotes at times, and the proudest one to date. Well, one of them, I think, is just that I, I said, the work, the true work of DEI is not about what's less than, it's not anything about deficits. It's saying that no one is greater than, it's saying that we're all equal to. And so how do we, for a person who didn't, was not a math person, it said it's all in the math of life, is it not? So just helping people understand how it just weaves together a more beautiful society and sector when we continue to think that way. And, you know, women, 
women of color are the backbones of their communities and yeah. really of many of the workplaces as well. So to just be able to continue to strive to, um, shouldn't have to strive I know. to continue to advocate for um, proper recognition, pay, uh, promotions, opportunities. Right. Yes. So delving more into that wage gap part, what do those, what do nonprofit employers need to know to be a part of the solution there? Well, uh, nonprofit employers and those in the search community. Yeah. And they, I think I've seen a lot of leaps and bounds, like of, of growth over the past few years uh, that, that power dynamic has yeah. shifted. It yeah. used to be, this is what it is. This right. is the role. Right. Don't I have a hundred people clamoring for it? And then the clamoring stopped and it was like, oh, you know, I have to think about, does this work for the woman? Mm -hmm. Does this work for her lifestyle? Is she a caregiver? Maybe she's not. You know, there are assumptions made even when you're not a caregiver, then can you work an extra 80 hours a week? <laughs> you know, yeah. but really there've been studies that have proven when you, you know, you, you may not have children or, or you know, or, or be coupled in any way um, that you then are doing lots of other things in your life. So right. just not making assumptions. Um, it's the same thing. The same yeah. thing that is true about fundraising is true about life. And that is getting away from the transactional model and method. And I know that that's up your alley, yeah. but it's part of my life's work in this sector as well, that we get to know people, Yep. people working together, understanding what people need, understanding how, when you provide that, how you're just going to spark that talent to be able to just, uh, you know, achieve your goals and, and go beyond the goals. But if you're not happy, if you're tired, if you're not paid well, That's then, right. you know, it just doesn't work. That's right. What advice would you give to candidates who are unsure of whether they're being paid for what, what they're worth? Uh, well, visit the woke job board. <laughs> Yeah. We were one of the first organizations uh, to require salary transparency. Uh, I also testified before the New York City Human Rights uh, Commission Committee uh, on yeah. salary transparency and pay equity. Kept pushing through, got lots of senators, lots of elected officials. I want to shout out Power in New York, where I'm on the board for advocating. Um, and we just got it. The bills were just signed, you know, um, and it was a very exciting thing to see. Uh, so do your research, understand what the going rate is for the, the women out there, yes. uh, check the job boards because we were one of the first places that would post that type of information. It would be posted other places without the salary range. Um, and then they come to the local job board and say, oh, so there was a recon mission <laughs> going mm -hmm. on as far as that's concerned. And I think that the employers just need to, um, also do the assessment to take stock of. What do you look like? Um, if it's a woman, if it's a woman of color, what's your board look like? Mm. Is she going to be, you know, we were just talking, I'm from Nebraska. So yeah. I, I had something that I had coined first fatigue because I've been the first one of a few, the only yeah. um, so many times in my life. And for a while I got tired of that. And then I started to realize the power of being a trailblazer. But if you're trailblazing all the time, sometimes, you know, there's a fatigue that can come with that. Absolutely. Um, but, but I embrace it, you know, as often as I can, but is that what your organization looks like? Is she going to come into a winning situation? Um, or are you setting up a woman and a woman of color for success? Uh, and then on a deeper level, we have to talk about the relationships, you know, I, I talk about scarcity mindset within groups of women of color, but then also on the other side, Are you dealing with allies? Or are you dealing with people who are not allies mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to non-people of color? Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that we have to sort through and that we have to be really honest about. And I think that for those who are looking for their next opportunity, they have to have honest conversations with that potential employer yeah. um, in order to know on both sides if it's a fit. Yeah. You know, um, speaking of allies, um, Something I think often as a middle-aged white guy in the fundraising industry, there are a lot of us in there, is how can I be a better advocate for women and women of color in particular? And I don't mean to put this all on 
you to make my job easier, obviously. But I wanted to ask you if there's something you'd like me or other nonprofit leaders to know about how we can be better advocates and allies. So Woke has a sister organization called Allies in Action Membership Network, and that was okay. created because of the outreach we were receiving um, around 2020 on around allyship. Yeah. And what I would say is I'll talk about the four pillars of allyship, Great. which are education, legislation, inclusion, and action. Okay. And under action comes philanthropy because you put your dollars to work as well. That's right. Um, but really at the crux of it all is not prescribing. So what I mean by that is listening and not thinking that what you think is the right answer or the right thing or the right path forward. Hearing from people about their experiences. Sometimes there's a give and take and there's a space for you to be able to share you know, your thoughts, but sometimes just listen. Just listen because then you'll start to understand because as human beings, we all know that as far as uh, implicit or unconscious bias is concerned, we all have it by virtue of being human beings, right? We're here on the earth yeah. together. We all have biases, yes. uh, you know, and we just have to, you know, al allies who listen are some of the greatest allies. They, they take action in partnership and thoughtful action because they educate. They understand the role mm -hmm. that legislation plays in it, mm -hmm. especially in a year like this. Mm -hmm. They think more inclusively, which simply also means to think differently. It's so easy. I call it the New York City, city block mentality yeah. uh, and probably other cities too. But you know, in New York City, you're not going to go further than a block if you're tired, you got home. If it's for food or whatever other vendors that you have, it's just going to yeah. be convenient. Yeah. Um, but when we're thinking more inclusively, it's like you're putting together a panel. You could go to the usual suspects, the people that you know, you're friends with them. They're nice people. Yeah. But how many different perspectives are you really gleaning? Can you take the extra day or so or a few hours mm -hmm. to go to your team and say, who else could we get mm -hmm. who's equally as qualified? who's equally as brilliant, but perhaps we haven't platformed them yet. Yeah. It's just thinking differently. It's not thinking deficit, it's thinking differently. So when you don't prescribe, when you listen first, you take thoughtful action, you educate yourself, uh, then that's really impactful and effective allyship and accepting the truth about uh, mm. the imbalance of equity in the history okay. of really the world and, yes. and, and of this country in particular. Um, and you may not have all the answers, but accepting the truth is really important. And because right now the pendulum has swung and we're experiencing the backlash because there's a beautiful quote. It's truly unattributed. Several people have taken kind of credit, but you okay. know, to those accustomed to privilege, equity can seem like oppression, right? Yes. So when we have all of the economic theories of like white resentment, all the different things that can happen, Allies in Action is currently doing some research on white fatigue. We saw it start in April, 2021. Yes, yes. We've, we've had our eye on it I since know. the advent of the COVID vaccine. Yes. We knew that it was coming. Yes. And so, and it's here, it's here full force now. And it's like, how do we work together to get past this, um, to accept the truths of the history and what they mean for us right now and to be able to work together to find meaningful solutions? That's right. I agree. That's so good. Well, for women who are interested in nonprofit management and leadership, what mentorship opportunities do you see out there for them? I see so many opportunities. And also, you know, we've always talked about that word mentorship, which is extremely important. Uh, what I would say, as far as mentorship is concerned, there are many different opportunities out there within professional organizations, organically finding a mentor, reaching out to someone, just asking if you can chat with them. Yeah. Um, I know Woke has a program called Mentor Match, but we also have a program called Check-In Chicas. That's an executive accountability program. Sometimes you don't need a mentor. You just need somebody to talk to who understands yeah. your lived experience, right? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, we, we pair people up that way. Um, and then I would say the other thing is sponsorship. There's mentorship and sponsorship are related and they're similar, but 
you know, sponsorship goes a step further. A mentor relationship could be, I'm giving you some free advice. We're meeting up for coffee. We're meeting on Zoom and sponsorship just takes it a step further. It's like taking action on that person's behalf. Um, and so I think we want to see uh, mentorship continue to evolve into yeah. uh, further sponsorship as well. I think that's great. And I think it's really important too. I love that sponsorship idea. I want to delve into that more myself. Um, Which is perfect for you though, Jeff, it is yeah. because mentorship, there are some nuances around it where there may be certain comfort levels that sure. are, you know, it's somebody that looks like you, somebody that you have that shared lived experience. Totally understand. Chicken Chica is definitely, when it comes to sponsorship, we need the people in those positions of privilege to be sponsoring, yeah. you know, as a, as a means of equity and inclusion. So you are a perfect sponsor uh, and you have sponsored people probably not even realizing it. You've done a lot in your allyship journey. Um, but yeah. So sponsorship is that area where yeah. the allyship can even come into play more powerfully. I kind of look at it, Yolanda, that it's really going to be white men in power who understand what equity means and give and is able to share and give up some of that. And it's unless we do that, it's going to be very difficult to reach that equity uh, state where people not are only equal, but that they have the same opportunity. Um, and uh, it's going to have to come from us who are in power right now. It's white men. Mm -hmm. and we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that and figure out. And the sponsorship idea really is a big part of that. Um, yeah. I believe. Well, lastly, I want to ask you this because I know, uh, a lot of people want to hear about this, but what is you, what was one of your biggest career in who's been one of your biggest career inspiration in your past and oh, who's inspired you the most? <laughs> uh, I would have to say that I've been inspired you know, even the way that I grew up, I always say I was raised by a village of people strategically placed. I'm a person of faith. I say they were placed strategically placed by God uh, to guide me to where I needed to be in my life. Yeah. Um, and I feel that way about my career. I'm so grateful uh, to so many different women. Um, there's one woman who comes to mind, though, way back when I was a young person, had just moved to New York and I went to, you know, a professional organization meeting and she grabbed me by the arm. She was like a one woman uh, DEI committee <laughs> in and of herself. She's a white woman, you know, okay. but she knew it. She got it. Yeah. And she grabbed me by the arm and said, I'm going to get you. It was so hard to even get into committees, you know, yeah. at that time, but she yeah. brought me on board and she had been just the greatest mentor to me. So here's a shout out to Lori Croatman, um, out right. there. And, uh, but, but so many, I'd be remiss, um, uh, to name names because yeah, there's so many, yeah. uh, but there have also been, you know, women, it was a, a wonderful woman. I'll give her a shout out. I've given it to her before, but Carmel Napolitano, um, she's a friend. She's part of the allies group. We've been friends for many years and she's the person who helped me understand my worth. You yeah. know, I had become so complacent uh, where I was. And then I was telling her my salary and she thought I was joking. Mm. And she began to open my eyes to, um, you know, the real salary range that I should have been looking at. And I've never turned back since. Like That's she awesome. really sparked something in yeah. me. And it was just having lunch with her and her sitting me down and saying, whoa, you know, um, and we all need a person like that, you know, and to keep those networks and, and things going. Yeah. So I've been very blessed to have many different people um, yeah. in my life, my family, friends, colleagues that helped with my career trajectory. And and what's cool is you've taken that and you've passed it on. I'm sure there's many women out there that would say that you are their inspiration for their, mm -hmm. for their career. So well, that's thank awesome. You for that. So Yolanda, thank you so much for being here today and for this really inspiring conversation. If you want to connect with Yolanda, be sure to check out her, the show notes because we'll have all the information in there. And if you're listening in right now, I hope you're feeling encouraged by these stories and by our shared goal to champion women in fundraising. If you'd like to join a community of fundraisers who are dedicated to supporting each other, 
I hope you'll join our free online community. You can use the link in the show notes to create a profile and get started. So thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for the Nothing But Major Gifts podcast from Veritas Group. Richard and Jeff also write an ongoing blog that you can subscribe to for free at veritasgroup.com. Please join us again next time.